We are so glad that the Lord directed your steps to be with us here on a Saturday evening. You know, there's a lot of things that you can be doing on a Saturday, but to come into the house of the Lord to give him praise and thanks is a wonderful thing. Amen. Well, listen, we're going to get right to it tonight. Um, as you all know, over the last couple of weeks, we have had members of our ND, which is our new discipleship group that have been coming forward to, to share what we call the seven minute revelation. As part of their discipleship, they have the opportunity to present what the Lord has been putting on their heart during their time of, uh, of study and, and contemplation. So tonight, uh, we, we have the, the wonderful privilege of having one of our deacons who is in the, in the class, Deacon Brian Lawley, uh, bringing the word tonight. So let's welcome Deacon Lawley to the pulpit as he brings the word. Praise the Lord. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for allowing me to be here tonight and talk to you all. I really appreciate it. Um, I acknowledge uh, glory to God, but it's all good. It's all good. So I, uh, I know uh, Romeo's supposed to be coming up. I'll try to leave a few minutes for you, Romeo, before we're done. So I wanted to touch today on the talk, talk about the Lord, how he miraculously can turn an uh, 18-minute message into a seven-minute message. Key verses are pray without ceasing and with God all things are possible. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your time given to me, to all of us, Lord. We just praise the Lord as we truly speak on the top tonight of uh, recognizing your breath in us, Lord. There's those that don't get that opportunity to breathe. They don't get the blood circulating through their bodies, the opportunity to worship you and know you, Father God. So it's, it's this topic of sensitivity to, tonight, Lord, is... Cherished by my heart, I believe all of us in the same way. We just praise you for prompting me uh, to uh, instill what you have to speak to not only us at Legacy Family Church, but a topic that should be spoken in every church more often. We just praise you for this opportunity and this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, just kidding about the uh, 18 minutes to seven minutes, but uh, it's a nice icebreaker. Um, message and topic that I'm gonna speak about could easily expand way beyond that 18 minute range. Uh, there's, there's so much involved in the plight of the unborn. Um, so here we go, Ray Church, here, here we are. 64 million. Just breaks your heart, makes you wanna cry. 64 million is the number of individual children who have been lost to the abortion crisis since Roe versus Wade was enacted in 1973, last 54, 50 years. It's a staggering figure. Um, worldwide, even more, they can't really fully understand what the numbers are, but they're saying anywhere from uh, one to 1.5 billion worldwide abortions have happened since, as far as we know, since, uh, uh, I'm not sure how far back the number goes, but it's quite a bit. I had a slide, I don't know if it's gonna function or not, but there was an individual part of the pro-life movement who tabulated uh, the number of states, which I had a list of states up here. It's 19 states that he figured equal the approximate number of 64 million. As you can see, these 19 states he figured. So imagine all those states wiped out of all the population. That would give us some understanding of what 64 million uh, equals according to this individual. So which, with such numbers, the womb has now been penned as the most dangerous place to live or exist or to start. It's very scary. So the title of my message I put coined was uh, Voice for the Innocent, as we need to be that voice for the innocent. Verse-wise, I went, the Lord led me to Proverbs 31, Verse eight and nine, last book of the word of, of the of the book, word of Proverbs, it says, "Open your mouth for the innocent. Open the mouth for the innocent, and the cause of all those appointed to die." Verse nine says, "Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy." That should be all of our hearts. My heart was moved to speak on this. Uh, I've been out uh, almost every Saturday, uh, third Saturday of every month with Love Life with several of us, but the showing has been quite uh, uh, lacking a lot of times. So the Lord was prompting me to minister, encourage us to come out in numbers, not only our church, but other churches as well. Um, sometimes we've had only five or six out there. 
So why, why should uh, we should be out there like a flood, not a trickle? Not just for us, they're a legacy, but for all, all the churches. And it's growing little by little, but it's, it's needs, I prompted to see there needs to be a move there. So today, the call to action for us is to be led out to those clinics. Clinic death, as some have called them, the abortion vulnerable. So I'd like to acknowledge all those, though, that have gone through the painful experience of abortion. I know it's a very difficult one. I don't want to be sensitive to that. I want you to know that there is hope, there is healing, there is God's grace and mercy and love poured out. A lot of us have been through the experience. God wants to use you, you know, get you through that point of healing so that you can be used in a mighty way. He wants us to all be available in use, and He loves and forgives you. You're not, you're not, uh, a product of that abortion, you're a product of the love of Jesus that's transformed your hearts. So as I was saying in verse 8, it says, open your mouth for the speechless and the cause of all those appointed to die. The king here, King Lemuel, who a lot would say, uh, uh, pose that he possibly that refers to King Samuel. The, the king was called to be present. King Samuel, King Solomon. What am I saying? Samuel, King Solomon to be aware, to intervene in unjust causes and minister to those in need, to his judges and court decisions, he recognized weren't always judging righteously. They were making decisions that were not uh, right and people uh, in his kingdom were dying from that. So it's a call to the king to be cautious to all those who were appointed to die. It's a call to us to stand up for the abortion laws and positions that are out there to stand and, and have a voice. To do rightly and take a position was for the king and us as well, to be an advocate to minister for those opposed to, to this, to minister for the innocent, and this without the fear of man. Uh, verse 9 refers to opening the mouth for the poor and needy, Re judge righteously. So many poor and needy are at these clinics, don't have the opportunity, the poor in spirit. They don't have the spirit of God and understanding. They need to know the love of Jesus. They need to know God loves them and cares for them, wants to minister to their needs to know that they can stand for their babies. They can take a position of life. They can speak out against those voices that are telling them to an opposition, telling them to get rid of their babies. We want to encourage that. That's why we're out there. They need to know that there is support. There is a place of love, that there is means and provision for them if they, if they would call and walk in the right choice. They've been betrayed. They've been abandoned a lot of times. They don't know where to go. So we're out there being that voice. So the scriptural purpose here was to lead the king uh, is actually ministered by his mother. And also, we are called in the same fashion to lead ourselves, to lead those, uh, to, to be led to minister in those areas if God would call you to that. I believe all of us are called to some, to some extent. So are we leading ourselves, including you and me? This is a command, not just as it was for the king, for each of us, that should motivate us to action for those in need, for those who are uh, desperate in these situations, we are called to appear to be present, to stand and be vocal, to be out there preserving the innocence of blood that's being poured out, to stand in the gap and defend those who are unable to fight for themselves. In reference to this horrid slaying of the unborn, there's a few thoughts here. Consider the claim that the top causes of death are said to be uh, heart attacks, cancer, accidents, those frail in comparison, 100 to 200,000 a year maybe, but when I talked about the number I just gave you, on an annual basis in the 1990s, 1.6 children in the United States were being uh, slaughtered at the, at the death clinics uh, last year. It was down, it's gone down a bit, but still a staggering 878,000. That just frails in comparison to the leading causes of death as we hear about them. So we must not be fooled. This is murder. It's a hard word, but that's what it is. You know, graciousness is over those who have gone through it. We're not condemning you. But Jesus gave himself willingly. You know, we compare this. Uh, Jesus gave himself willingly the innocent blood for our lives, right? He served, he shed his own blood for us. But the, to execute, execute the not yet born, can you imagine? Uh, stealing the life and the lifeblood of babies for us all. This has been coined to be said as Satan's counterfeit Satan's counterfeit altar of sacrifice. The only thing planned in these places is execution for the most part. Execution of the innocent, sacrifice on the enemy's altar of convenience, as we said. 
they are slaughtered in such a horrifying way as well. You, would, you couldn't be imagined. You could look it up. I'm not going to describe it today, but the, the horrifying methods, anybody who saw it unplanned gave you a little bit of reference to what goes on there. But it's terrible. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Way beyond that, too. I mean, some of the methods are just scary. So this, by far, is the number one greatest offense against our Heavenly Father. Now I would, uh, they're systematically destroying babies, indifferent, intentional actions, easily and quickly snuffing out the child within God is in the process of creating. It's tragic. So why is this? Why in such great numbers? We would say there's no fear of God, the depravity that exists nowadays in the last 20, 30 years, and even more now. Lovers of self, lovers of pride, prideful, blasphemous, unholy, without gods. That's what 2 Timothy 3 tells us, 1 through 3 tells us. In Romans uh, chapter 1, 28 through 32, it says that he gives those who are opposed to his will over to a debased mind to do those things that are not fitting. Tragically, you know, this end, end up, ends up coming to the point of slaughtering babies. It says there are those who are wicked, malicious, murderers, evil-minded, haters of God, violent, proud, all this translates. And if that's so, then verse 32 says, those who approve of those, it references those who practice and approve of them. Are we those who practice and approve of them if we're not standing up? It's a lack of understanding of God's love as well. Aram spoke very vividly two weeks ago regarding the nature and effect of the gospel. The gospel and power of God is hardly shared with these abortion, vulnerable, abortion-minded. The church is not positioned. If hearts aren't touched with the gospel, the love of Jesus, then death will continue to reign but we can be the light there, right? We can discuss at length so many of the aspects of abortion, of the of this the aspects of this great evil against our Father in heaven. I'm not here for that. I'm called today to challenge us, to be called to action. Recall what the Lord instructs us through James. James 2.18 says, Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 20, But do you know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. So how must we respond? God commands us to go do the work. I think we all know too well what it says about Jesus says, what will Jesus do? That phrase, what will Jesus do? Does the obvious answer to that compel you? It should. It has me. As King Lemuel was commanded to take action for those appointed to die, so are we. What's holding you back? We should all be out there on Saturday mornings and whenever possible. Let me provide four tools to guide each of us in response. Simple tools, actually. Simple words. Pray. Pray. Has God not been He's to direct us? Ask God to give us the opportunity, the heart, the desire, the time to participate, to be present, to take away any fear or apprehension. I was fearful going out there. It's not easy being out there at Planned Parenthood and other places. I think all, we were, all of us who out there have had a sense of apprehension at times. But, but you can do it. We're, we're there in numbers if we're there together. Ask the Lord to send laborers. That means me and you. For favor and for freeing up our schedules. Plan. Put it on your calendar. The third weekend each month is planned, not parenthood, is where we are. Also, every Wednesday at 5.30 a.m. And we desire to expand that. In Ventura County, they're there every, every hour that Planned Parent is open. There are people out there. Multiple churches have banded together. So as God, as God grows us and guides us, we'll continue to grow to minister over there in Van Nuys Plant Period. Plan and ask, what do I need to do to be there? What do I need to do to free up my schedule? Who do I need to invite to come with me? Thirdly, prepare. We have to prepare our hearts, put on the full armor of God, be more mindful in prayer about it. When we drive there to Planned Parenthood, we're praying on the way. So prepare our hearts and minds. This is spiritual warfare. Ask God to reveal to us more of his heart to, to this atrocity, this abortion atrocity. Pursue healing. Pursue healing for those who need it so that you can be effective, you know, those who have been involved in abortion, so you can be effective witness out there and the power of God working through you. And search deeper into his word. What does it say about how God values life? Seek after compelling and, and competent training that can help guide us. Love Life is an amazing ministry that we're a part of. You can participate in that too. So lastly is participate. Show up. God be present. It does nothing for us to just think about it as a good idea if we're not acting, if we're not there, if we're not the voice. God works through us as a team. Two are better than one, it says. 
one, we'll put a thousand in flight, two to 10,000, so we can be there and participate. We receive courage and strength from one another. There is joy and fulfillment, and we grow in Christ as we serve together. Another way to participate is to vote. You need to vote for righteous leaders who will stand up for the cause and minister uh, the gospel truth to those around them. So righteous leaders, those fearing God who will stand for pro-life principles and other godly principles. And as God leads you, support ministries like Love Life, Planned Parenthood, I'm sorry, Open Arms, I'm sorry, not Planned Parenthood, not Planned Parenthood, Open Arms in Jesus' name. So I truly appreciate what Chris, Chris said recently in his message he shared with us last Saturday. He said, believe the Lord, the battle belongs to him. He goes before us. She said to worship him and he shows up. He will show up there as we believe. Jehoshaphat came to realize this and so must me, so, so we must as well. Then we can trust and see as God uses us intervening for these babies and we can praise him and worship him. Babies are being saved. Life's turned to Christ and traffic to the clinic reduced threat strategically we are we're prayer out there is that Planned Parenthood will close all parent Planned Parenthoods will close so we're out there in prayer James 4 17 finally in closing says therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him is his sin we must submit to this command to be a voice of action against this this present Holocaust too long has a womb been the tomb of the father's innocent silent ones thank you very much appreciate your time Thank you. That was good. Come on out, people. Good job. Good job. Great word, because it's true. We we see it every Wednesday. We've seen it in the prayer walks. We've heard it with various testimonies uh, pertaining to this particular cause. It's amazing to to get involved in in any capacity. You know, like they were here. Uh, uh, was it Natalia was here a few weeks ago, and she spoke on it. And, and it's not just giving of your time; it's giving of of prayer, right? Interceding and also financially. You know, th there's so many different ways we can support. So we can say, oh, I don't have the availability, the open spot in my schedule to support that ministry. But we could support them in other ways. We could support them by, by interceding for them, and we could support them financially because it takes it takes it takes you know funds to to get the signs and 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 get all the stuff going, the material that needs to be printed. I mean, I went and bought toner the other day. That was sixty five dollars. That's just for my own computer, like you know my own printer. So it, it we, and I'm printing. I I do kill trees. I, I apologize, but you know. Uh, cause I'm old school. You know, I have my computer and stuff, but I, I like to keep, I, I like to print stuff. I like to touch it and see it, you know? So, hey, they're, they're sending out flyers. They're doing so much work. So in any way that you can help, it would be great. So good word, uh, Deacon Lolly. And with that said, um, I wanted to, uh, to talk to you guys about the Good Samaritan, right? We've all heard the story and, you know, we've always say it here in this church, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing that I'm going to convey to you guys that's going to see the story from a different perspective or, or give you new insight into it. I, I just simply want to share it and remind it because, we, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more we hear it and, and we see many, many uh, uh, books in the, in the scriptures where it just keeps repeating. And you know why it keeps repeating? Because we need to get it through our head. Right. We need to hear, hear it multiple times to finally get it, to finally understand it. And maybe the, the last time we preached about the Good Samaritan, you know, five years ago, you already forgot about it. It didn't click with you that day. So hopefully some of it resonates with you guys today. So let's uh, let's stand to our feet and let's turn to Luke 10. And we're going to start in verse 25. For those who are able to stand. And say amen when you get there. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, 
You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, to him, go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Lord, and we just, we're so thankful, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, for your precious word, Father. I just ask you, Lord, that as we read your word tonight, Lord, as we dig into it, Lord, that it resonates in our hearts and in our minds, Father, that it convicts us, Father, that it gives us um, an understanding of your truth, Father. I just ask you, Lord, that whatever word proceeds out of my, out of my mouth, Lord, that it is approved by you, Lord that it is aligned to your will, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your precious son. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, so, so I wanna, so we read it, right? And you see the conversation that Jesus is having uh, with this, you know, says lawyer, you know, like a scribe, right? It's someone who, who, who knew the law, who understood it and, and was well educated and was able to have debates and discuss it and and dissect it right and right off the bat he's coming in and he's having this discussion with Jesus but as he's approaching Jesus it wasn't with humility he's coming to Jesus to test them to to see if he could catch him in a trap or or or, or find a way to make Jesus look bad right so I want to give you some little background on, on, on the area, right? So in the time of Jesus, the region, that region was divided into several territories, including Judea, Galilee, Samaria. And Jesus and his disciples, they travel extensively through these areas, right? We see it throughout all the stories, right, where uh, all the documentations. And you see where, he's, where, where Jesus is traveling with the disciples, right? Um, and the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, was about 17 miles. Um, and it was treacherous. It was like very difficult terrain and dangerous terrain. Hence, someone getting robbed, right? This is why Jesus gives him that particular example, because it's something that is going to resonate with, with him and with whoever else was listening, because they're like, oh, that happened to whoever, such and such person. That happened to one of my relatives or however they remember it, they can recall it. You know, if I grew up in, in Inglewood, right? And that's not a nice area, right? If you go now, it's nice. It's, it's really nice now, m most of it, right? But when you talk to people about Inglewood and, and certain cities, it's automatically already associated. Oh, it's dangerous, right? You know, you go, if, if someone says, hey, I'm from Compton, people can be like, oh, yeah, he, he, he's a real one. Even if you're not affiliated in any way, they know that you grew up in a certain kind of way and you have to grow some thick skin because you're you going to get picked on and th there's going to be some, some, some dicey situations growing up in that environment, sometimes from your own family, right? So he, Jesus, is explaining the story, right? And he uses that as the backdrop for it, all right? So then it's, it, was a, it was a steep descent. It was dangerous of robbers lurking, rocky terrain, and tra travelers often face the threat of violence, making, making it a really good backdrop for Jesus to put it right there in the story, right? 
Um, so then we go into the other part of it. It's the relationship between the Jews and Samaritans, right? So the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans during this period was trouble with tension and animosity, primarily because Samaritans were descendants of the Israelites who had intermarried with the Assyrians, okay? And because they had intermarried with them, they brought in their own their own gods, their own ways of worshiping, their own ways of doing things. So that has all, had always created a problem. So this, uh, they were t- conquested the Northern Kingdom in seven, 722 years before Christ. So this is not something new. This wasn't like a like a beef that just started like right then and there. Like this had been brewing for 700 plus years. They had been dealing with the relationship between the Sumerians and, and the Israelites. They had been dealing with it for a long time, right? And this, this, like I said, it caused the mingling led to religious and cultural differences that deeply resented the Jews of Judea, okay? And uh, and Galilee. So Samaritans worship Yahweh, but had their own temple. They have their own temple that they, they don't go to Jerusalem to, to worship Yahweh, to worship God. They go to a different mount to worship him. So right then and there, you're already planting your flag somewhere else, and it's going to create a divide. So that's one big issue that they have. Another issue is they only accept the, the Pentateuch. That's the only thing they accept, the first five books of the Bible. The first five books, the Torah, that's the only thing that they subscribe to. Any other literature, any other scriptures, they weren't, they weren't feeling that. That was their theology. So then the, the Israelites are like, oh, that's heresy. That, you know, we, we're not agreeing, agreeing with that. And this is why there was so much friction between them. So you fast forward to Jesus' time and the, the mutual distrust, the hostility uh, had cemented like significantly. It's already, it's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. I mean, you got people hating on people because your relatives told you to just hate them. No other reason as to why. You know, you know that people are not, people are not born racist. They're not. They're made that way. You know what I mean? That's the way you teach them. The way you teach them is the way they're going to grow up, and it's the way they're going to teach their kids. It, it's, it's the false narrative of, of victimhood and all these different things that get put in people's head. Look, when I was, when I was in Iraq, I, I was patrolling inside of school, and I found books. And these books were describing the first Gulf War. And these books were approved by Saddam Hussein. He approved writing these books. And the way he wrote it is that the U.S. invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. He didn't mention that he invaded Kuwait and we went to help Kuwait. He didn't mention any of that. He mentioned that we were the ones that were hostile, that we were the ones that invaded. And furthermore, he put down that they won, that they won that war. You know, that's the history that he wrote himself that his government approved. And it's not any different when you grow up in a society in, in a certain region where it gets passed down from generation. It becomes their reality. It becomes their truth. You know, there's no way to shake it. You could explain to them. We could sit with people. We go afterwards, go to Starbucks and have a conversation with someone and open the scriptures to them and, and show them clearly in black and red what the word of God says and guess what? They'll say, ooh, that makes sense, but mm, that's not the way I was shown. And they're going to go with their own logic. They're not going to go with the truth, with what the Word of God says. Because when we talk about teaching when they're young and when they're old, they won't depart from it. What is it that you're teaching them? That's important. If you're teaching them something that's heresy, if you're teaching them false doctrine, that's what they're going to think is the truth, right? So this goes, this plays into everything. And it's, it's so amazing how Jesus picks this. He picks a Samaritan to be the hero in the story. You know, he picks the backdrop because to, to, they can relate to it. And then he, he picks the Samaritan to really drive it, drive it home and really make it clear to them. So 
you know, the, the title of this message is uh, The Compassionate Heart, okay? And it's Lessons from the Good Samaritan, all right? So I want to I wanna just go down here, and I just want to break down, like, uh, verse by verse. So if we go to Luke 10, verses 25 to 26, right? So it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? Jesus, he's like, oh, he, he's trying to test me. Let me ask him because he knows he's not coming with this, with this humble heart. If you think about in, in when, when Nicodemus comes and talks to Jesus, he came with a contrite heart. He came and he was really wanting to understand how, do, how are you born again? He was trying to understand. And Jesus is explaining to him in such a manner that, it was hard to explain, like, wait a minute, I got to go back in. How, how is this going to happen? And to Nicodemus, it wasn't making sense, right? But he had this heart that he really wanted to understand. This, this gentleman, when he comes and talks to Jesus, Jesus already knew because he knows everything. He knows, oh, the way he's approaching me, it's not right. He's approaching me in a way that he's testing my authority. He's a testing, he's testing my reasoning. He's testing the, the, the knowledge that I have, the wisdom. That's what this lawyer was doing because he was full of wisdom. But the wisdom he was filled with, although it's, it, it was, he was reading the scriptures, he wasn't living it, right? So he had the knowledge. He could, he could repeat all kinds of scriptures and all kinds of, uh, of knowledge, but what good is it if we're not practicing that, right? That's no good. So Jesus Boom, already knew. So Jesus tells him, um, he goes, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And then the, ex, the, the, Jewish, the expert of the Jewish law said, um, it's not really, he says, he tells him that um, when he answers him, he tells him, okay, this is the answer he's going to give him, right? And he tells him, Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you this answer. And the answer he gives him is, uh, you shall love your, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, right? So the lawyer, basically, he's reciting uh, Levitic, Leviticus 19.18, and he's also reciting Deuteronomy 6.5. This is what his response is to Jesus. So he responds to Jesus with the word. And Jesus says, okay, cool, right? And he tells him, then go do it. Go do it, right? Go do that, right? So he said to him, you have answered rightly in, in 1028. He said, you have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. Because he was asking him about eternal life. So he gave the answer. The, 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 the lawyer gave the answer, and Jesus says, perfect. You know the answer. Now go and do it, and you will live. You know, you answer rightly, do this, and you will live. So Jesus affirms his answer, emphasizing the understanding of the commandments intellectually is important. So we must understand it intellectually, right? But true adherence requires active, practical living according to the principles. So like I said earlier, yes, he understood what it meant. He understood what the scripture was saying, but he wasn't really living it. He wasn't really applying it. He, he could pervade him. He could say it. Boom, boom, boom. He could uh, knock out all these scriptures and, and quote the books, but it wasn't going to do him any good, especially right off the bat, the heart that he came with. He came with a heart of, of, of pride. Like, hey, I'm going to challenge Jesus. I'm going to challenge him because I know a lot. Right? And we could get into, into cycles like that where we think that we know what's best for us. We think that we know what we should be doing, yet we're not submitting it to him first. Right? It, we'll, we'll say, hey, I'm going to submit to the Lord if I'm going to go buy a house. I'm going to make a big purchase. Right? Like big things like that. I'm going to get, I'm going to propose. You know, we, we think about these big life changing uh, decisions and we think about putting those in God's hands sometimes sometimes we don't 
But what about all the other things? What about the rest of our walk? That's a very small amount of decisions that we're truly taking to his feet, that we're truly placing at his feet and saying, you have it. You have your way. You show me. Let it be your will. Let it be your timing, right? Because we acknowledge, it. how many people here about a house? The stack of paper you got to sign, it's, it's like it's like this, and, and you got the order, you know, the person notarizing, and they're like boom, 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 stamping, and you're signing. I know that when my wife and I went about a house, we were like, we're sweating, we so much to the point we're like, I'm already, we're they already cashed my check, like everything, right? And you're still thinking in your head, man, I hope it gets approved, like it's done, like it's a done deal. You're, you're literally, you got money in the escrow account. Everything is, is pretty much set in motion. Inspections have already been done. Yeah, you're in your head you're thinking, how about if I move into the house and then they call me and say, you know what, we made a mistake. You need to move out. Hey, th- I've never seen it with a house, but uh, we, I had a friend who bought a car and she told everybody, I bought a new car. And three days later, they came and took her car. They said, oh, you know what? The bank called us and they, they changed their mind on, on financing, on financing you. So don't think it can't happen. I mean, God willing, it doesn't happen to any of us. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just a mindset, right? We go to him for these big, big things. But what about all the other things? What about all the other decisions? Because, look, every decision that we make, there, there's a consequence behind it. There's, there's a reaction behind that. So we need to be truly uh, uh, acknowledged that we're not in control of it. He's in control of it. And we need to just submit to him when it comes to those things, right? So um, so he quotes Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, right? And when you read these, it's, it talks about the daily declaration of faith for devout Jews. And it emphasizes total devotion to God. Um, It talks about ethical treatment of others. When you read those verses, that's what it talks about. Uh, It's it's summarizing the moral obligations towards fellow human beings. That's some of the areas that these scriptures are covering. Um, It talks about when he combines these two commandments, it encapsulates the essence of ethical and religious life. It's putting it together in 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 a nice package, all wrapped up, ready to go. And it's easy for... It should be easy for us to just read it and be like, oh, that's the way I should act. That's the way I should behave, right? And it's fundamental, not only in, 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 the, in the Jewish religion, but it's fundamental for us as Christians to love our neighbor. It's these, these, these scriptures that he quotes, they're fundamental to us as well. So if we go to Luke 10, 28, right? He said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. So Jesus, he affirms him, and then uh, he challenges the list to go beyond the knowledge and to manifest love and compassion in tangible ways, right? So in Luke 10, 29, here he goes again, the lawyer. He's not just taking Jesus' word. So first he wants to test him, and then he gives him the answer, and Jesus said, go and do that. But that wasn't enough for him. This is the, the lawyer again. But he wanted to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor, right? Once again, he wanted to test Jesus and see what Jesus was going to say. So the lawyer, he was seeking to justify his conduct and possibly to limit more obligations. You know, if you have the Messiah, if you have Jesus and he puts restrictions and he paints himself into a corner, now, like, okay, he said it. I mean, many of us have done it. Hey, that's the way we do it at work. Like, hey, Susie does it that way, so I'm going to do it. She clocks out five minutes early every Wednesday, so I get to clock out early every Wednesday. You know, the examples we set, people like to follow those, you know, because they say, oh, well, I'm not the only one that's doing it. How many of us have done this on the freeway? I'll I'll raise my hand because I don't speed. I really don't. I really don't speed. But... I've caught myself many, many times when there's a car just speeding. How many of us have jumped behind that car 
and start speeding too. Because you're like, if the cop sees him, they're going to see him first. How many of that? See, like, we got some honest people in here. Hey, many of us have done that. Many of, because you know what? I, I had a guy, I had a guy in the Marine Corps that was with me, and he's, he's calling, he used to drive really fast, and he's like, oh, I need to find a rabbit, he would tell me. He, he, in, the, in the highway, we were carpooled together, he goes, I need to find, and he would see someone speeding, boom, he would get behind him and just, just switch, whatever that guy's going, he was going. And he wasn't even racing him, he just wanted that guy to take the punishment, that guy to get the consequences, you know, because he has a little more reaction time because he's behind. So it's the same thing here. We got people, we got this guy, he, he's testing Jesus to see if Jesus is going to paint himself into a corner in, in, in a way where it's, he won't be able to get out of it. You know, I, I was just talking to Brian uh, before service. You know, when I interview employees, um, I talk to them and I ask them, I have a lot of evidence. I have a ton of evidence of everything they're doing in the store, everything they're stealing, everything they're doing wrong. But I ask them, hey, walk me through, how do you sign up someone for a credit card? And they take me through all the steps. Okay, how do you sign them up for a loyalty rewards account? And they take me through the steps. Okay, how do you do a return? When a customer comes in and want to return a product. Oh, well, I scan it. Well, how about if the customer's not in front of you? Well, I can't do the return. So, you know, they, they give me all the policies and procedures on how to do all these various transactions. Oh, well, what kind of ID do you need? Do they punch it in? Do you punch it in? Like I ask them all kinds of questions like that, right? Why? Because when I get to the meat of it of what it is that they're doing that caused a loss to the company, they can't tell me they didn't know the process. They just walk me through the whole process of how it is they're supposed to effectively and efficiently run that type of transaction. It's the same thing here. He's trying to get Jesus to, to say it in such a way that later on he could say, aha, uh -huh, I got you. That's not what you said. And Jesus was tested over and over in this manner. You know, when they asked him about, uh, paying taxes, same thing. They were trying to pay. It. He goes, "What's due to Caesar?" Right? They were trying to get him into a corner where where they could say, "Oh, see, he's supporting that." No, no, hey, that's one thing. This is another thing. You know that I don't have. I'm not the one that's controlling that. That's the law of the land. Same thing here. Hey, we pay taxes. We should all of us be paying taxes, right? And that's the way. The law is written. Now, if you have a business and you're able to write stuff off and do it all legally, then great, right? We should be able to take advantage of those things, but not in a nefarious way, right? So he's trying to, he's trying to paint Jesus into that, right? So he says, um, who is my neighbor? And the lawyer seeking to justify his conduct and possibly limit his moral obligations. And Jesus said to define neighbor. He said define neighbor. Right? This question reveals a lawyer's desire to find a precise and perhaps narrow definition of what a neighbor is. Because if, if I gave you guys all a piece of paper and I said, hey, define what a neighbor is. Just write it out. One sentence. Define it. We would all pretty much put down the same answer. You know, the person who lives right next to me. You know, the person who lives on my block. Around those parameters. And that's very very narrow-minded if we really think about it in defining neighbor. So that's why Jesus is he's smart. You know? He knows everything, right? So he, he's explaining to him, right? So um, he goes, okay, uh, his questions reflect a, hum a common human tendency to seek, to seek clarity and boundaries and ethical obligations. We're always looking for that loophole. We're always looking for a way out of that contract or a way out of getting, you know, getting out of work, whatever it is, we're always trying to find that loophole. It's part of our nature and it's, it's bad. You know, we should definitely, when we talk about putting our flesh down, that's something that, that we should be fighting daily to put down and, and, and not take those shortcuts, you know, not do things with excellence as he's demanding us to do it. It's, it doesn't benefit us, 
if you're going to go run a race and the race is four laps and you do three laps and you say, oh, yeah, I won and you get a medal, right? What benefit is that? You did not do the race. You shouldn't get a medal. But society, the way is constituted right now, I mean, if you want to do one lap, then you, you can still get a medal. There's a participation trophy for everybody, yeah. right? So Luke 10, 30, then Jesus answered and said, a certain went, man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Jesus be, begins a parable saying the familiar and perilous route from Jerusalem to, Jer to Jericho. Um, and it, like I said, it was notorious for its terrain. So think about it. Samaria is like right here in the middle. And if you could go from the north to the south, you just cut right through. They went the long way. The Jordan River is right here. They would go around it to avoid the Samaritans, to not really mix with them, to not have any interaction with them. They would take the long way, which was dangerous, it, it would, not just in the terrain, but dangerous in criminals catching up to you and all that stuff. And, and it's a longer route to take. You got to go this way and then back, right? So, um, so he's talking about that, right? And so, the, uh, so then he's telling, so the audience will immediately recognize the danger and the desperation in the man's situation. He's talking about the, the, man, who was, the man who was robbed, right? The desperation that he must have had. I don't know where in the story this happened. He doesn't explain that, right? Imagine it happened. He got robbed like in the middle of nowhere. Like it's one thing to get robbed right here. Like you might see foot traffic. You might see some, some people hanging around that area. But you're like up here in the middle of your journey. You, you're you don't have access to no one else. So Jesus is painting it so they can see, hey, this is, this is what's going on. So, uh, and, and it, it just also paints our picture of, of just in general, like human vulnerability. How vulnerable we are when we step out of his presence, when we step out of his, of his authority, when we step out of his protection, right? So, in Luke 10, 31, now by chance, a certain priest came, about, came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest representing the highest uh, echelon of religious leadership in Judaism, right? And encounters the wounded man, but chooses to avoid him, passing him by on the other side. Now, this avoidance might have been due to concerns of, uh, about ritual purity. Um, it could have been uh, uh, touching potentially a dead body. You know, how about as he's helping him, he dies. You know, he goes to go help him out, and then he dies. Um, and then now that person is unclean, and they can't perform temple duties. They, they, they got to go through a process to, to get clean. So Jesus is telling, like, all right, cool. I'm going I'm to give you some characters that you would recognize. I'm going to give you some characters that you would admire, I'm going to give you some characters that fall along the boundaries of your mind of what you think is, let's say, good leadership, of what you think is being a good neighbor. Okay, so he's explaining that to him, right? And so this action uh, reflects uh, the prioritization of religious uh, ritual over the imperative of mercy. Think about that. If Pastor Jesse and I walk out of church and there's a, a, a massive accident out there, we're not going to hesitate. Many of us are not going to hesitate. We're going to jump. We're going to get blood all over. We're going to try to lift the car. Do whatever it takes. We're not worried about these re re religious rituals. We're not bound by those. We're not legalistic like that. We're not bound by the fact, oh, well, if someone died in my arm, ah, I'm sorry, Pastor Jesse, I can't preach next week. I'm unclean. I need seven days to, to clean. No, it, it's about the human nature and it's about, you know, choosing, you're either choosing that religious ritual or you're choosing mercy. Which one are you going to choose is what Jesus is telling him. So, and it's highlighting a moral and ethical failure to respond to human suffering. How? 
does this story get told? And we don't think about that. We, it, we don't go directly to them. Like, how can we be so callous and not attend someone, not go to their aid, not go and help them in their time of need? We, we, we talk about, oh, I love to help people. But who's really showing up? Who's really doing it? You know, Deacon Lolly talked about it. You got all these events, you know, speaking against Planned Parenthood. Who's going? Who's going to that? We, we need people to go because it was showing up in numbers. If you trust me, when a text message goes out and there's a text message that goes out, hey, we have a gay parade on Friday. Man, you know how many gay people show up to that? Right? It's like they'll they'll call, they won't even call out sick. They just will, they just won't show up, right? To go to this, to go support their car, to go support what it is that they're prioritizing over everything. We need to get our priorities straight when it comes to certain aspects of our walk, our life, our servanthood, our, our obedience to God. So, so he's talking about that, right? So he tells him the, 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 the priest, right? And in Luke 10, 32, he says, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Man, it reminds me of, I know you're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking, like when, when, I remember when I was a teenager and I walked up to the bus stop, I had no intents of robbing this lady at all, right? And as soon as I walked up to the bus stop, she just grabbed her purse and she was like, oh no, like he's going to rob me. Now, I had no intent. I didn't do it that time. I had no <laughs> intentions of doing it. But listen, it's the way you present yourself, you know? Hey, I was a lot slimmer back then and I remember... I, my weight, I probably had like, I should have been wearing like size 30s. And I was wearing like 44s, 46. I used to wear really big pants, right? So, of course, she saw me and she's like, oh, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to go to the other, the other, I'm across the street. That's what it reminded me of. Because it talks about, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at this place, came and looked. And he saw the danger. He's like, oh, no, I don't want to touch him lest I become unclean. He's like, nah, I'm not even risking it. I'm going to go to the other side. He's like, I'm going to walk away. I, I don't want none of that near me. And it kind of reminded me of just, you know, being a thug, I guess, you know, back in the days. But, you know, so you, you look at that, right? And it's, and it's the same thing as, as the other one. It, the Levi has temple duties. They got, they got stuff that they got to take care of. They got duties that they do at the temple. And, and he sees that he doesn't help him because Levites were also expected to adhere to strict purity laws. You know, the same things as the priest. They had, that's where the priest came from, from that, from that tribe. So they had to abide by these strict rules. And so the example that he gives is, is further adding to they value those rituals. They value those things above the Messiah being in front of them. The, 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 the mercy and the grace, the, the, the principles of what it is that they're following. When you read the scriptures and you read the principle and it's telling you to be a good neighbor, to love your neighbor, it doesn't, it's not by words. It's by actions that you show that you love your neighbor. You know, me coming outside and saying, hey, neighbor, that's not showing love, right? But, you know, my neighbor got locked out of her car the other day like, and I went and helped her out, right? That's showing, that's taking action, that's showing love, to her, and she's like, oh, okay, because she's, she's single. She lives by herself. She's lived in that home 50 years, right? So she, she, she has her kids that come every so often to visit her, but she found herself in a bind. Like, the garage is stuck. The door is stuck. Like, she couldn't find a way out, and she came and knocked on my door to come help. And you know why she came and knocked on my door? Not because I'm her neighbor, because she has a neighbor on the other side. She has a neighbor across, because I have a Psalm 91 sign in front of my house. So she's like, oh, okay. I'm going to go and ask him because he's going to be more prone to help me because because he's declaring his flag. He's declaring he's a Christian. Now, also, I have conversations where when I go walk my dog. So there's that 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 understanding. And we, we we we've had multiple conversations about the Lord and just just different topics in general. Right. So she felt comfortable to come to me. But, you know, you would think that a priest and a Levite that. They're like, oh, I'm going to do the, the, the Lord's work. I'm going to go help this person. But they're thinking, no, yeah, I, 
I don't want to get my robe dirty. Like I don't, I don't want to be unclean. I don't want, I don't want to have to go through this cleaning process and 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 do all these things. Uh, think about when they did the sacrifices to the animals. How dirty that temple, that 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 section was, and they had to clean it daily, daily. So very important that Jesus is highlighting these characters, these these people in, in the scriptures to point out to this lawyer who thinks he knows everything, to point out to him the definition of neighbor. So we go to uh, Luke 10, 33. So, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Uh, obviously, complete opposite of the other two, right? Um, complete opposite to the religious figures that people looked up to. Samaritans were looked down upon. Religious leaders were held up high. They they were giving ex, they were given extra stuff. They were taken care of by people. It was an honor to have them in your home and have a meal with you. They 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 got a lot of little perks because they remember they don't work. Their work was the Lord's work, right? They didn't have jobs. They didn't have homes. Everything was taken care of by the community. Everything they didn't they didn't get like a. a, a you know, a payment like 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 we get a payment like that. It's not like that. They had specific guidelines that they follow, right? So, uh, Samaritan journey and it's complete contrast to the religious figures, right? Samaritan despised and considered heretical by Jews demonstrates genuine compassion, and Samaritans and Jews harbor deep mutual animosity rooted in, in, like I told you, in historical in their historical religious and ethnic conflicts, right? So, the choice of the Samaritan as the hero of the story. It's not only provocative, right? It's it's rebellious, like in the in the sense of it, right? And it's also challenges to to really look at, at our deep seated prejudice. Are 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 these? We we I know a lot of us have gone through through uh, uh, training at work where they talk about these these things that we that we have in us that we don't even know we have. You know, like oh, if the person says this, then this is the way they're going to behave. Like we have all these things based on how we grew up, right? Um, so it's the same thing here. And the choice of Samaritan as a hero of the story is, like I said, provocative. So the Samaritan's immediate and heartfelt response to the man's suffering transcends ethnic and religious boundaries and simplifying true neighbor love, right? So in Luke 10, 34, so he went to him and bandaged his wound. And then not only did he go to his aid, in Luke 10, 34 and going forward, he goes above and beyond. So he goes, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. So he has his animal, he set him on animal. That means he's walking. That means he's walking. He's he's injured so bad or to such an extent that he can't walk. And obviously he's not gonna carry him. He put him on his animal. That's a big sacrifice for him to do that, right? And then um, so he brought him to, oh, then he goes, um, sent him his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The Samaritan's actions are detailed, practical, and generous. He treats the man's wounds with oil and wine. Common, those were common first aid materials back in the day. They didn't, you know, when they talk about oil and wine, we're like, why, why is he putting oil and wine on him? Well, you know, it has certain, certain oils, certain spices, they have healing, uh, um, attributes and, and that's what they used back in those days as first aid right so it provided antiseptic uh, soothing properties he then transports the man on his own animal indicating a willingness to inconvenience himself uh, for the sake of the injured man take him to the inn and continue to take care of him where he demonstrates a comprehensive and sacrificial approach to taking care of him in Luke ten thirty five, on the next day when he departed he took out two denarii gave him to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So the Samaritan ensures that, hey, I'm going to take care of the time he's here and I'm going to give him something so he can continue to recover. But he leaves instructions. He says, hey, if additional costs start to accumulate, when I come back, I will take care of those as well. Right. We're talking about going that extra mile. He went above and beyond that extra mile, right? So taking whatever you do 
And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So the Samaritan ensures that the man's ongoing care by paying the innkeeper and promising to cover any additional costs. Two denied representing significant financial support, uh, equivalent to two days wages. Two denied is two days wages in, in those times, right? Um, indicating a substantial commitment to the man's recovery. This level of gener generosity and responsibility they exemplify what, how we should treat our neighbors, exemplify how it is that we should behave. Um, so the Samaritan's actions challenge the listeners to consider the extent of their own compassion and responsibility towards others. So in Luke 10, 36, so, which, so then now Jesus turns the tables. Now Jesus is asking him, right? He goes, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Jesus concludes the parable with a direct question, right? He's asking, he's asking the, the, the lawyer, hey, which of these three represents neighbor, right? Like definition of a good neighbor and or your understanding of neighbor. By asking which of these three, the priest, the Levi, or the Samaritan, acted as a neighbor to the man, Jesus shifts the focus from, from like a theoretical definition to an actual definition. He goes, look, I'm giving you legit examples. This is not a textbook definition. This is real world definition. This is what I'm giving you. I want you, just like you tested me, now I'm testing you. I want you to answer me, right? So, he, he says, um, so Jesus shifts it, right? And then this question encourages the lawyer and the audience to recognize true neighbor, like being a true neighbor, and embodies mercy and compassion rather than merely adhering to religious or social norms. So this is the answer he gives in Luke 10, 37. And he said, he who showed mercy on him is the answer that the lawyer gives to Jesus. He, he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The lawyer correctly identifies the neighbor as the one who showed mercy, acknowledging the Samaritan's compassionate actions, despite ethnic and religious differences. Jesus' directors go and do likewise challenges the lawyer and listener to transcend social and, and, ethical, and ethnic boundaries. So this conclusion emphasizes that eternal life and true righteousness are achieved through active, selfless love and service to others, Fulfilling the true spirit of the law. So in these three, if we could take three lessons from, from these scriptures, right? Redefining neighbor. The first was redefining neighbor. Jesus concludes the parable by asking which of the three was a neighbor to the injured man. The lawyer is compelled to acknowledge that it was the one who showed mercy. The, this underscores the fundamental truth. Our neighbor is not defined by proximity, right? It's not defined by ethnicity. Is not defined by shared religion, but by our capacity to show compassion. That's how we define our neighbor, right? So we got to get out of that box. Oh, my neighbor, and we take it even further. My neighbors are the ones I like. You know, I don't really like my neighbor across, but the one here is really cool. No, that's not a, the definition of neighbor. Jesus put it back at him and gave him the examples to see how he would react. And the only logical explanation he can come up with is, oh, the one that showed mercy is the one he came with. And this is why when we, we have to redefine it to that, it's not about proximity. It's not about ethnicity. It's not about shared religion, but our capacity to show compassion and mercy. It's not about what we have in common. Right? It's not about what sports we like. It's not about the color of our skin. It's not about any of those things. It's about truly showing compassion and mercy when that compassion and mercy is needed. That's when we truly are honoring that commandment to love your neighbor. That's when we truly honor that. So that's one, one lesson that we can take from that. Second one is breaking barriers. So in breaking barriers, it says, the parable challenges us to break down the barriers of prejudice and the hatred that divide us. There's way too much prejudice. There's way too much hatred. There's hatred in areas where there shouldn't be hatred. People make up hatred. People go on Instagram and, and look at someone posting a picture of their four-year-old. 
doing like ballet. Someone, some way, will make that racist. I'm telling you, read the comments. Someone is going to make that, in one way, shape, or form, cause division. Right? Oh, she's only doing it because her parent, because she's white. No, it's, it has a, maybe the kid likes it. Right? Maybe that's what she asked for. Maybe that's what the parents wanted to do. It's not about it's not about that. So we need to redefine neighbor, but we also need to break down those barriers. Stop putting us in this little box where it's race against race or or uh, um, gender against gender, whatever it is. It's not about that. We can't love our neighbors if we're continuing to to behave in that way where where we're continuing to to promote division. And I'm talking to us, the church as well. We do it too. We, we're supposed to judge. Yes, we're supposed to correct. But we also need to speak with love and truth, right? It, it's, I am no one to judge whether you're going to hell or not. I can only point to the scriptures that say these things. The, the ultimate judge is Jesus. It's not us, right? So, so the Samaritan's action teaches that true compassion transcends cultural, ethnic, and religious boundaries. In today's world, we are called to extend our love and assistance to all, regardless of their backgrounds and beliefs. I mean, we can't. Imagine if, if you went to the hospital and you had to donate blood and you said, oh, I can't donate to that person because, you know, they're Muslim. Like, I don't support that. That's not the way it works. It, if, if he needs my blood and I'm able to give him my blood to save his life, then then I should do it. You know, in, in, in the military, it's so amazing because there is no color in the military. We're all green. In the military, we are all green. Some of us, some are dark green. I'll tell you that, okay? But we are all green, okay? We, we have our, uh, in, our, in our things, it says what blood type, we have, whatever. If, if someone needs my blood, they know I'm B positive, and and we get put on the on the on the helos, depending on on our blood types. Everything is organized and structured in such a way that if there's a if there's an accident and there needs to be a, a transfusion, right, like blood transfusion, there's someone else on your team who's going to match that blood, or there's going to be a universal uh, donor on that on that helo with you, in case anything happens, right? So we. We don't care. I don't care if you put pump Chinese, black, white, whatever blood you pump. It's it, at the end of the day is blood, and it's gonna save my life, and that's all that matters. And that's what he's telling us. We we don't need to put those those. We need to break those barriers down. Uh, the the third thing that we get from this message is active compassion. So the Samaritan's care was not passive. He didn't say, "Oh, let me go get help." That would kind of be passive, you know, like, I'm going to help them, but I'm not really going to do it, right? I, you know, there's people say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it, but then they don't do it. Oh, I'll be there Saturday, but then they don't go on Saturday. I'll be there to set up, but then they won't come for set up. I would love to be on praise and worship. Oh, cool. Well, you got to practice on Thursday. All right, cool. And then they don't come to practice, but then they want to be on stage. No, that's not the way it works. There's, there's God, our God is a God of order and structure. There's, there's a process to it, right? So active compassion, the Samaritan care was not passive. He took immediate practical steps to ensure the injured man's well-being. Uh, and he also calls us to uh, go above and beyond, beyond our words and our feelings, right? So we are to engage in acts of kindness and service even when it's convenient or costly. Can you imagine if this person was coming down, saw him, and he knows the closest in is back that way. Now he has to go back, let's say seven, eight, nine miles, go back, spend his time, his energy, his resources, his money, right, to take care of him. And then he's going to start his journey again. Now his journey's been delayed two, three days, 
right? He has a, how about if he has a family that's waiting on him? It ain't like now where you could just, not only can you just call people and get a hold of them, you, you could keep an eye on You could track them where they're at, you know? We, we got so much, like, it's not just, it's a different world now. He went above and beyond. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor, act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. So Lewis is emphasizing that love and compassion are often cultivated through deliberate, caring actions. You know, uh, my wife, she was in the kitchen, I, I think it was this morning, and it was funny because we were watching this TV show a couple days ago, and this couple, they're like, in the show, when, when they're upset with each other, they and they're going to have a, a, a heated conversation, they literally stand this close to each other, like nose to nose. And and, and they're like talking really soft, you know? Like, I'm not happy with you, you know? Like, you disappointed me. Like, but they're like literally like this. Like, and that's how they're arguing. And, like, and, and they're kind of like, it looks like they want to kiss, right? But they're not kissing because they're angry, right? And they're just talking to each other very aggressively and upset. But their, their skin is touching. And because their skin is touching, then you have that, you know, that, 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 that hit of dopamine, right? You have, oh, that's, that's my wife. That's my love, you know? So I told her, hey, when we have a disagreement, we should argue like that, you know? <laughs> so not that we were having a disagreement. This, we weren't having a disagreement this morning. She was literally washing dishes, and I said, hey, I want to talk to you. And then I got really all up. <laughs> she, maybe that could have started a fight. She's like, what is he doing, right? But listen, C.S. Lewis is right. It's, you could talk about it. You could say it, and, and you could say you're doing it but you're not going to really get to that point of knowing that you love your brother until you actually start doing it, until you actually start walking it out, until you actually start living that life. So, you know, that's, that's the way we should operate. So when you go home, for those that are married, and next time you get in an argument with your wife, <laughs> just, you know, I've heard, I've heard other ones where they say, if, you, if you're like, angry if you guys are upset with each other and instead of arguing just you know grab her hand and just start praying right just grab her hand and start praying because she at first she's like what is wrong with him you know and she may start praying maybe she'll even do it out loud maybe she'll start praying some stuff that you don't want to hear you know like you know she may start praying oh i'm really mad at him and please take care of him god whatever she says right but the more you hold in hand and, and there's that, that, that intimacy, right? It's going to eventually evolve to the Lord softening our heart, softening our stance where you can't help but pray positively. You can't help but to say wonderful things and blessings and praise about your partner. But we'll take it a step further. We'll get close. All right? I like that one. So... Um, so as followers of Christ, we're called to live out the radical love and compassion demonstrated by the Good Samaritan. This means examining our own prejudices and being willing to step out of our comfort zones. Um, to help those in need, it means seeing each, other, each person as made in the image of God. Whenever you're upset with someone, think about that. They're made in the image of God. This, that alone should fix things. Think about that they are made in the image of God, just like we are made in the image of God. Uh, the serving of our dignity, respect, regardless of their background. So in our daily life, we encounter opportunities to be good Samaritans. It might be helping a stranger in distress, uh, standing up against injustice. I saw a video the other day where a, a guy runs up to a little kid, like a five-year-old, and picks him up and runs into an alley. Right. Now, this is in a busy street. It looked like New York. And it's like a really dark alley. And runs in there. And there's people walking. And they see it. And they're like, wow, that's odd. And they just kept walking. And, and, and it's a reaction video. They're trying to see 
who's actually going to step up and go help that kid? You know, that kid could have just been multiple times, multiple, multiple people went in there and just g- grabbed the kid. And you see man just standing, like, standing idle, just looking like, wow, like, there's something in their head. Like, they're scratching their head. They're even looking at their phone like, did I just see this? Like, is this real? But what did they do? They just kept on walking. None of them, none of the men, it's a very short video, but none of the men ran in there to help this kid. Now, in one point in the video, same thing happens, and there was a, a, there was a young lady who sees it. I'm talking about her reaction time was amazing. Like, she got those quick reflex. I mean, she just, she just ran in there. No hesitation, no worry about her safety, no worry about her health. She just ran in there, and it could have cost her her life if it was a real situation. And, you know, they came out, and they're like, you know, they're saying thank you to her. She's the only one in the video that responded. It's men are weak right now. We need to step it up. We can't, man, God forbid any of us get caught in a video like that. You should, if, if you are nervous about something happening to you, just think about how it's going to look when you come to church and Pastor Romeo, I'll play that video. I'll play that video of you not running in that room, not running in that alley. As much as you don't want to get involved, do it. Do it because the Lord has put it in your heart to do it, but also do it so you don't get put on the video. Okay? So, hey, it's, it's about that. We're made in the image of God, deserving of dignity and respect. Um, so every opportunity we have, it might be helping a stranger, uh, standing up against injustice, or simply offering a listening ear. Sometimes it's that thing. We don't have to do this amazing triage and, and CPR and do all these things to help somebody. Sometimes just listening to them. It's, it's, it's significant, a significant change in our lives. Next time you go out and about and you see someone who's homeless, have a conversation with them. You might be the only person that has a conversation with them that day. The only person that, that looked at them as a human being, that looked at them that they were made in the image of God. Think about that when we're out there. And... Last, the parable challenges to make mercy a defining characteristic of our faith. When they said they'll know us by our fruits, we want to be known for that, by having mercy and faith and compassion and loving our neighbors. We don't want to leave any room for error. We don't want to leave any doubt. The video, we don't want to leave any doubt saying, oh, is that the church that would have their members just keep on walking. Imagine if, if we're in Revelation and they're writing a, a letter specifically on this, on being compassionate to our neighbors. Do we want to get put on that list as a church who just walked on by and just completely avoided the situation? Do we want to be that church who saw it and actively made the conscious decision to not get engaged? actively decided to go contrary to the word of God, contrary to his nature and being disobedient of him. So I I don't want to be on that list. I want to be on that list that, that, that God could say, man, I could count on this church that they're going to be the ones that are going to run into, into a, a, a building that's on fire that they're going to be the ones that are going to run into that dark alley, that they're going to be the ones that are going to see a lady being victimized or a child being victimized, and they're the ones that are going to step up. They're going to be the ones that go on Wednesday morning to pray in front of the Planned Parenthood. They're going to go on the prayer walk and pray, and if we save one life, that life is is such a blessing, just one life. We want to do one life at a time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word today, Lord. Thank you, Father, for for just leaving these, these amazing 
amazing examples, Father, on how it is that we should imitate you, Lord, on how it is, Lord, that we should behave, Lord, on how it is that we should walk and respect all who are made in your image, Father. Let us never forget, Father, that, that you created us, Lord, and that you are covering us, Father, with your precious blood, Lord, that you are watching over us, Lord, and that you have given us strength beyond, Father, beyond so that we can do so many amazing things. We want to be that, that Samaritan in that story that, that doesn't hesitate, that doesn't think about it, that doesn't care about his resources, that doesn't care about the negative effect that it will have in our journey, that the inconvenience of walking in a different direction, the inconvenience of sharing our personal belongings, the inconvenience of sharing our resources. None of those things matter. We want to be obedient to what it is you ask us of us, Father. Your word clearly says to, to be doers of your word, not just hearers of your word. And this is a perfect example. As we hear your word, Father, as we go out of this church and we go about our day, we go about our week, Lord, let us be emboldened to step up. Let us be encouraged to go out into this world and represent you in such a way, Lord, that it would be undoubtable that we belong to you, Father, that we will be unashamed of the gospel, that, we'll be, that we would be unashamed, Lord, to represent you, Father. We thank you, Father, and I ask you, Lord, I don't, I don't know everyone's heart here, everyone's relationship with you, Father, but I know, Lord, that, that you touch heart and that your word purifies us, that your word cleans us, Father, that your word takes away and cleanses our sins, Father. Just ask you, Father, if there's anyone in this room who doesn't have a relationship with you, Father, that today be the day that, that you touch their heart. Today be the day that they're bold and, and, and just stand up to their feet and raise their hand and jump for joy in knowing that you are our Savior, knowing that you died for our sins and that you rose on the third day for us so that we could have that gift of eternal life. And if there's anyone in this room who feels that calling, who, who knows that the Lord is tugging at their heart and has been pressing on them and pressing on them and has been leading them and has been revealing to them and has been showing them through the scripture, has been showing them through relationships that they need to walk in a different direction, that they need to turn away from sin and accept you as their Lord and Savior, Give them that strength and that courage for them to raise their hand today. If there's anyone in this room that is ready to accept Jesus into his heart, just raise your hand. That's all it takes. Thank you. Thank you. The angels are celebrating. We're celebrating and recognizing the lives given today to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. And likewise, if there's anyone in this building who accepted at some point in time, accepted Jesus into their heart, and through life, through troubles, through disappointments, whatever it is that you've been walking through, and, and you've turned your back on him, and, and you started walking in a different direction, I'm going to tell you right now, we've all had that struggle. The, the road is not just one straight road to Jesus, right? It's not just, hey, when you accept him into your life, all your troubles don't go away, right? It's, it's not like that. It, it, the, the burden gets lighter because we put it on him. He carries that load for us. But as we're walking and we stray away and, and we separate ourselves from his, from his covering, from his protection, we start thinking, well, is he going to take me back? I strayed away so far that I don't even know him anymore. I don't even recognize his voice anymore. I'm here to tell you that it's the same. Jesus is waiting with open arms to receive you. All you have to do is be bold again and raise your hand and tell him, Lord, forgive me. And he will welcome you back 
into his graces. He will welcome you back into the kingdom. He will heal you of your heart. He will heal you of the things that you're going through. He will help you. He will be your comforter. He will be your provider. He will be your strength. So if there's anyone here who wants to recommit their life to Jesus and recognize that they've strayed away, raise your hand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We got hands going up all over the place. Thank you, Lord. Church, I'd like you to repeat after me. With our heads bowed down, our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for coming into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life, Father. You are my Lord and Savior. I trust in you, Lord. Father, you're in control of everything. I am a new creature. I am a born again. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, for dying on the cross for me, for conquering death and giving me the opportunity of eternal life. Getting me down. From this day forward, I belong to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And I could, if I could ask, if there's anyone, for all those who raise their hand, feel free to come up and after service, myself, Pastor Jesse, Deacon Lolly, uh, the, uh, some of the ladies, uh, um, Randy, um, uh, my wife, um, Bethania, Pastor Jim, we're more than, than happy to, to, to pray for you, to listen to you, to connect with you, to, to hear you out and see where it is that, that, that whatever questions you may have, we're here to answer them for you. So if you made that decision today to accept him into your life or to recommit your life to him, be bold and come up, come up and we will pray and we will, we will connect with you in that manner. Amen.